if you remember, there was a Szechuan peppercorn was forbidden to because there was some kind of bugs um, probably 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you couldn't get real. We fill up two suitcases of Szechuan pepper from, uh, yeah. from Shanghai and bring it over here. So we had like 10 recipes with Szechuan peppercorn in different restaurants. So I needed to bring. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Today is JG Day, and we're thrilled. John George von Gerichten is the man behind his eponymous Midtown restaurant, as well as some of the most influential dining in the canon of American gastronomy. These restaurants include Spice Market, Jojo, 66, Vong, Matsujin, remember that place, and the Tin Building. When JG stopped by the studio last week, we didn't have a detailed plan for the talk. We wanted to go back in time mostly, but also talk to the man about how he stays fresh when operating restaurants in over 16 countries. We talk about his drive to earn back a third Michelin star at the flagship and where he likes to dine out for inspiration. We also talk about how JG travels, creates signature dishes, and remains one of the strongest and most singular voices in food without honestly doing that much press. We've been working on this interview for over a year and he finally showed up. Thank you, JG. We also talk about Wendy's, which is amazing. And really, it's such a pleasure having JG in the studio. And I hope you enjoy this conversation. John Joe's von Grieschen, welcome to This Is Taste. What a what a fun conversation we're going to have. Thank you for having me. It is um... It's a pleasure to be here. You're 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 part of uh, my world, and we talk to chefs all the time, and 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 they're all inspired by you. I feel like there's not one I've spoken with who hasn't been to the flagship, or been to Perry Street, or been to Vong, or been to or or just read one of your books. Or everyone is inspired by you. I'm guessing that I'm that old. <laughs> That's w- this year I'll be cooking cooking for 51 years, so I guess uh, <sighs> I don't know. I've been around the block. <laughs> That's the problem when we're talking about these interviews, and it's somebody who has a long career. We're not trying to like age you out. <laughs> no, don't please. <laughs> I don't want you to go anywhere. I really don't. I just feel I'm just warming up. Yeah, you are. Let me ask you to to, to start because we can go in so many directions, and like I could talk about your history and growing up in El- El- Alsace, Laurent, but I, I don't want to go there. I want to actually go to the modern John George. What are you enjoying restaurant wise? That's not your restaurant. Is there any? Do you go out to restaurants at all? Yeah, I always try the you know New York. There's a there's three restaurants opening every week and a couple of closing as well. But uh, you know, so I'm always inspired by the new ones. You know, Torizi at the at a, right now it's really one of my favorite. Yeah, have you been to Privé, the the private club? I've been to a private club as well. I went to I've been around, on, what, but I eat a lot of Japanese food. So two three times a week. Last night I went to Blue Ribbon Sushi for a quick uh, family bites, and then uh, depends, you know. I you went them. to Blue Ribbon. I love that <laughs> name. It's almost like a blast from the past. I feel it like is. it's definitely. Um, what's good at Blue Ribbon right now? You know everything. You know they always have the great fish from um, Japan or for locally, and they, they do great rolls, and it's just a. Uh, in and out quick, and now, yeah, you know, fix. So, but but you do find time to go to other restaurants. Chefs. I do, I do, I do. I try to go. You know, never before nine thirty, ten o'clock at night. But uh, yeah, you know, I try different things, new things. So part of the John George mythology, and I w- I've always wanted to ask you this, and we, we've not done this interview on a podcast ever. But are you at your flagship? I, I've heard that if you're in New York, you're at your flagship at least once a day. Is that true? Absolutely true. Yes, um, there all the time. I mean, uh, I'm kind of a chef business guy now, but uh, I never stop my love, which is cooking. So it's my therapy. So I need my two, three hours a day uh, going to the flagship, try some new dishes, you know. Only when you put your name at the door, you have to be there once in a while. Are you just tasting the, 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 the dishes of the day? I think it's a control freak issue. It's a flavor issue. It's a, you know, you put your name at the door. We have two star Michelin and we try to be, I try to... Get it back. We got three for like 12 years and I try to get it back. And uh, it's really the place where we only do testing menu, my omakase. <laughs> yeah, your version of omakase. Exactly. So yeah. we only do testing menu. And I just enjoy the small dishes and constantly creating. And my, my brother is there, so we spend a lot of time together. Yeah. De- degustation. Aren't we calling it that? Menu degustation. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, you had three stars Michelin for, for 12 years and yeah, you, right. you now have two. Yeah, that's right. Um, you're a competitive guy. I, I just know it. I know. You got, a, how are you going to get to three then? I don't know. I'm trying, we try every year, you know, and I think it's all about pushing always the, 
new flavors, new boundaries, new, you know, experience. I think, I feel today that our clientele completely changed. When we opened in 97, 28 years ago, it was, uh, you know, it was a uh, different restaurant. Now our clientele is completely new now. It, uh, the, you know, clientele back in the days were between 50 and 70s. And <laughs> I feel like today is from 30 to 50. So it's a... Uh, That's amazing. It's amazing how people are looking for experiences, looking for flavors and, you know. Is that because of Resi? Maybe Resi, maybe... No, I think people want to... They come to a place, my flagship, like jean Georges, they, they really want to experience the best of uh, what I do. And But you know? now it tends to be in the 30s and 40s if you've made... Uh, you've made you know some money. Um, you go there as a special occasion. Younger generation is there now. Totally a younger generation. On you know some people come once, twice a month. It's amazing. Before it was like once a year for an occasion. Yeah. On a field now, the people are going out for experiences every week for in different places. But back when you opened, it was it was definitely a uh, older crowd. So yeah, all the all the crowd. I think uh, all my customers when I arrived in New York in '86 from Lafayette, uh, from JoJo, and, yeah, you know, it was '66, '66. Uh, <laughs> yeah, famous Sex in the City reference from the early 2000s. That's great. Right. That was a great episode about the '66 episode. I know, I know. I, it's so great. I mean, such a classic yeah. restaurant. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. What? Why, what? Why did it not succeed? I think we. We were maybe too close to Chinatown. My fried rice was 14 instead of uh, $4 in Chinatown at the time, but I used fresh crab meat. I used uh, impeccable high-end ingredients. So what I feel as well, you know, it was, we opened a couple of years after the 9-11. So the, the area, I think, Tribeca really changed a lot. But we never understand why, because it was designed by Richard Meyer. He was, he was my take on Chinese food. I thought it was the, the best, you know. But it was like... Clearly, and, and Spice Market also would, would come later. And I really want to talk to you about that restaurant. Yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely legendary restaurant. But 66 was uh, doing uh, crab fried rice. You say $14. You're like, that was too expensive. It's like amazing to hear that. Uh, 2002. Yeah, right. <laughs> the way the way things have changed. Yeah, yeah exactly. On the, you know, people compare us to uh, two blocks away where they could have uh, steamed sea bass from an aquarium for not much money. And for us, well, like, you know. You've been driven by the flavors of Asia your entire career, and and it's it's remarkable how you know your 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 depth at at keeping it honest, in, because it's honest to you. This is the JG point of view with Asian cuisine, and not trying to do some something else. No, you know it's a classically trained. When I was twenty three, I went to Asia for five years, so I was still an apprentice. I was still learning things. Even I was the chef in a in a restaurant in Bangkok. Yeah, it just for me was a. It was a learning part of my life about ingredients. You know? I never had fresh ginger. I never had lemongrass. I never had fresh coconut milk or mango or, you know, those yeah. galang, galang, gal, chili, or anything like it. I mean, the first time I tested the coriander, it tasted like soap to me. Well, in the paste form or just in the ground up powder? Oh, talk about fresh. Yeah. Fresh coriander. Fresh uh, coriander. Yeah, like like cilantro for me tasted like very soapy. Yeah, yeah. I'm from Alsace. I know only parsley. Yeah, I, I mean, he, having cilantro in the Southeast Asia without having the experience it must have been really It was, it was amazing. So for me, it was a game, um, a life changer in terms of ingredients and incorporating uh, all those, you know, spices and things. And when I arrived in New York, believe it or not, in 86, you know, Square Market don't have much to offer at the time, just apples and potatoes. The only place I was comfortable was Chinatown because, you know, you remind me of uh, my five years in Asia, so that everything I needed. You also bought your knives down in Chinatown. Exactly. Famously, you you really put um, a young company on the map, that early yeah. knife company. Yes. You remember walking into the door? Corin. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Corin. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you put Corin on the map, and I've spoken with the founder before, and it was really influential. I mean, how you were somebody who sought Corin knives in Chinatown back in 1987, 88. Yes, and then we opened Vong in 92, which... Uh, I use all my plates. I went to Japanese plates, so I went to Corin. At the time, she she was a warehouse, yeah, third floor in a rundown uh, brownstone in in Tribeca Ch or Chinatown. It was Chinatown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, I said, "What's this, what's this plate? Beautiful color, terracotta, and all the things and stone. It was stoneware." On she said, I, "I can't even sell it." I said, "I buy you the whole stock. I need it. I'm opening a French Thai restaurant, and I, I really want those plates." That's exactly the story she she told me. So yeah. it fact checks. It, it's a really good story that when you bought the stock out to to make Vong what it was. Now, what were the early reviews for Vong like from the New York Times and Gourmet and all the people reviewing that? Oh, it was uh, it was amazing. I mean, we did the 
you know, David Rockwell design, I think was the, only the second restaurant he, he designed way before Nobu, way before anybody. Yeah. On, um, we made the, the cover of uh, New York Magazine. Yeah. Picture of the, the restaurant. Oh, that was it. I said, all right. Arrival. New I mean, York. You're talking about your early 90s, New York Magazine cover. There is no internet. You are literally the talk of the town. How are, how are you handling this personally, John George, when you're on uh, the cover of a magazine that isn't really covering food that way? How do you, how do you handle that? I mean, it was most about design. So yeah. I was very, we were very flattered that uh, you sure. know, it was supposed to be a simple Thai restaurant and you become like on the cover of your, your magazine. Then uh, it changes the game. You know, people come in and then New York Times came in after and it doesn't stop. You know, people are looking for. So it helped us to push the, the level even higher, you know. So it's amazing uh, what the press did at the time. I mean, today, everybody's a critic. Yeah, I know. At the time, uh, you had to depend on uh, Gail Green, Brian Miller, you know, the- Ruth, Rachel. Ruth, Rachel. You know? She all, was all she was after Brian uh, Miller. She was. Yeah, yeah but, um, you know, so there was uh, different things. You depend on the New York Magazine, you depend on the New York Times, you depend on uh, all those newspaper, the Post. I mean, I think you have a really smart way with press because you, you do it very selectively. That's why I feel being on the podcast, I really appreciate it because you don't do a lot of it. You no. seem like very selective. I'm a, I'm a cook. Yeah. On the end, you know, I cook with some ideas. And today I feel like I'm a frustrated designer. I love creating restaurants. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was either being a, you know, an architect, a designer, clothing designer, or on, I was not good for, for school. So I ended up in the kitchen. Would you ever reopen Vong? Yes. A lot of people ask me about it. I feel know. like I'm asking you right now. That would be I pretty know. cool. People ask me about Spice Market. People ask me about a lot of uh, things that we created or don't exist anymore. Was Matsujin too early? I think in the end, no, I think so. I think after 66, we said, you know what? Let's stick with the Asian pattern. On At the time, Honmura An, I don't know if you remember the restaurant, on Mercer. I do remember that. Couple step up. Yep, yep, yep. On, they closed on that year, and I said, you know what? Let's change... Uh, 66 to a, a Japanese and we did soba. And you, but you brought in a master. You brought in somebody into your world who wasn't you. Yes. <laughs> Essentially. But, but uh, for 66 as well, we had this Chinese master. He was 87 years old. Ah, okay. I flew from Hong Kong to spend six months with us. He was retired. And my favorite restaurant in Hong Kong was Manoa at the Mandarin Hotel. And he retired. I called him up. I said, listen, I'm, I want to open a Chinese restaurant, but I want all your dishes. On you know, I trick it after I find the product. But I want all your, uh, only came for six months, only teach us to, to uh, how to do the, all the dumplings, all the beggar's chicken. He did a lemon chicken. It was amazing on two flavors. Tell me, tell me about the lemon. Let's go there. What's the memory? What's the taste memory, John George? I mean, just like squeeze lemon. Believe it or not, he used pastry cream. Really? <laughs> you know. Wow. Pastry powder. Yeah, yeah. Chicken stock. Little pinch of MSG was still. Yeah, it was still good. At the it's time. like sweet and sour we're talking <laughs> about here. It was super uh, yellow from the pastry cream, and it was yeah. sour, and it was perfect for the chicken. Wow, lemon chicken! What a fun. There was three ingredients. Play on that! Wow. Uh, yeah, That's... you know when you cook it, Chinese food or any Asian food, most of the the sauces and things are in bottles, soy sauce, um, oyster sauce, uh, you know, all the chili, chili things, and the crunchy chili paste. They, they all, they all. Uh, Bottled, uh, they're all shelf stable. You can like ship them over from exactly wherever you want. Yeah, yeah. So definitely. you have no like front cook cooking. You know, you have all those stocks. Chinese cooking, you have all those bottles. All those bottles, and it definitely travels well. We've spoken about a couple of restaurants that had relatively short runs, but I really want to focus on one that you opened in two thousand and four. It's called Spice Market. You did two very progressive things here. You opened up in the meatpacking district, which at the time in 2004 was nothing. It was not what it was today. It was really, really kind of on the outskirts. And you brought Southeast Asian flavors into focus in a way that hadn't been done downtown in that way. I mean, there certainly were restaurants doing Thai and, and, and Malaysian cuisine in outer boroughs. But you brought this all into focus. And I want to know, how was this restaurant such a hit for a decade? My dream was always to open uh, this Southeast Asian street food. And the only place you could find a big space like this was uh, in downtown, you know. So in the meatpacking, uh, at the time it was only pastis, the old pastis location, which was a block away. Florent. Of course. Do you, ever, do you, do you, get, do you stay in touch with that guy? Do you I, know Evan him? No, no, no. He's in was, Florida, I believe. He's in Florida. I've heard that. He helped us, I guess, to, to get a legal license at Spice Market back in the He days. helped you out, yeah. yeah. He helped us out. He was the mayor of the area. Definitely. And when I look, look at the space, we... You know, it was like 16,000 square feet. I was like, what are we doing here? Oh, no, we actually, we, we cut a hole in the middle. We, it, was a, it was actually a four-year of uh, in the making. We, Jacques Garcia was a designer. 
and we went to actually on a trip in India and we bought all those um, all those artifacts who was who were real. I mean the floor was an old temple. That's floor. incredible. I mean if you walked into this space It was magic. And now it's like a restoration hardware or something. Is that no, right? No, no, nope. it's a, actually it's a it's a watch store now. It's a watch store now. So we we, we had it for like a, actually a, we opened in two thousand four. It was so successful. We were doing like fifteen hundred covers a day. Jeez. <laughs> on somebody approached us to buy it. On today, looking back, I would never. I should never sell it because they destroyed the entire place. Yeah. So when they bought it, what was the transaction? What was the agreement? I mean, the 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 idea was to develop more of them around the world. It was to do one in London, one in uh, here, one there, left and right. So we did a few, but you can never repeat that uh, space, you know. With the, the same artifacts, so it's like taking a photocopy and doing a photocopy of a photocopy. It just it was impossible. Degrades. Yeah, it was impossible to repeat it. So we we sold it. Uh, it was a great uh, great deal. After uh, ten years, they couldn't keep it up. Yeah, I mean, I regret it. That's my biggest regret, and I should never let it uh, let it go. It was my um, it was a dream. It took four five years to put together, and uh, then you know the offer was hard to refuse, and you should have refused it. I should have refused. You should have refused it. And do you <laughs> believe back, if you would have refused that deal, it would have still been open today? It would be still open today. For sure. For sure. But you know what? We It's funny. We So we sold it. So we developed about five of them around the world. And then uh, it was Starwood was the, the buyer. And then Starwood sold it to, was sold to another big group. And, you know, it was a big uh, corporate America. So they, could, they didn't know how to run it. Yeah. And, and you, you had to go with, uh, you think about, as they say in, the, in sports, you just think about your family. Your legacy by by taking that check, but it was it was sad. I mean, <laughs> what I remember about Spice Market too was Piche Ong. Pastries. Amazing, yeah. The, the talent that we attracted, Piche was uh, the best pastry, you know. Truly, let me ask you, John George. You know, you're in New York a lot, but you also I was looking at your website, and it's like literally, I'm like, there's like countries that I didn't even think had American restaurants, <laughs> and then <laughs> there's like a lot going on these days in your empire. How do you handle the the the, the QC? at these restaurants around the globe. Is it 17 countries? I'm just, am I making that number up? I mean, it feels... Close. I think it's 16 countries. I was yeah. close. I was one off. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And we, um, we have, what, now, 65. We're going to open next week our 66%. That actually, number is yeah. pretty good, right? Number it, for you. Yeah, that's my number. <laughs> and we're bringing, actually, um, ABC Kitchens to London. Yeah. In a new hotel called uh, Emory. And actually, is a is Kitchen, Cucina, ABC V... You know, the trilogy of the but menu on the one roof. So we were looking forward to open that. Is there a city that you're operating in right now that you, outside of New York, that is, that you're just like most excited about that city, being in that city? I think Kyoto. You yeah. know, we opened a small hotel uh, with our partners from London. Nine room hotel. It's like a Rio Can in wow. the middle of the Guillaume area of uh, Kyoto. And it's so inspiring. You walk, I was just walking down the street and looking at the, you know, the river, the the the, the food, the little stalls of, um, you know, ramen noodle here, you know, tofu there. I mean, it's lots of vegetarian restaurants. So um, pretty amazing. The Kaseki cuisine in, in Kyoto has, has such a has, oh, a, has such the, a history. I mean, on, on the vibe, on the you know, it feels the vibe is a great word. It's a vibe in Kyoto. Let me ask you: Did that deal where you like I get like two weeks a year or one week a year to stay there? At the hotel? Uh, a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago. <laughs> but it's really a dream hotel. It was designed by uh, a great architect and it was just, it's just a beautiful, um, yeah. beautiful space home. Let me ask you, when you're looking to expand, you, we just mentioned that you did take a paycheck back in 2004 and maybe you regret it. So I'm, I'm assuming you don't just take deals from money because you could have all the money you want. But John George, to be remain John George, requires an editor, some taste, an aesthetic. All these things. How do you look at a city and say yes or no? I mean, first of all, it has to be a city that excites me to go there. Otherwise, um, you know, the reason, you know, going to London for me excites me on uh, going to Kyoto, Tokyo, Shanghai. Las Vegas? Las Vegas. That's, yeah, but we come think about it. We When we started there, on, what, 25 years ago, it was, yeah, uh, yeah we said about 25 years uh, last uh, fall, only it was just Wolfgang Perk at the time. On today, every major restaurant. Every. So it's it's it become a a mega food uh, city. It was in, probably in the more world. fun back when you opened twenty five years. Nothing ago. was there. Everything has been poked. Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> I mean, that's. But like... we decided to do a steakhouse, meat on potatoes. Yeah. But today, the, the this year, the fifty best in the world gonna be held in uh, Vegas. Yep. So it's. You'll be there, I'm imagine. Yeah, so it's gonna be. <laughs> I'm not on the list. I was uh, one point. I was number four, but after a while, uh, you know the. You disappear. 
So that's interesting. I mean, let's talk about that because yeah. it's like the tastes change and there's like buzzy names. You get like Austria Francescana gets its one. We got Noma gets its one. You got Guy Central gets one. But then like you got, you're operating right, your flagship right in the middle of New York City. And it's like never been better. Never been better. So why aren't you on that list? Because, uh, you know, there's 50 other better restaurants. Nah. Or newer restaurants. <laughs> Hard disagree. That's not, there's nothing no, about better. Uh, listen, every year there's a lot of new things happening, new experiences. Okay. And, uh, it's, a, it's a different, uh, you know. So I was happy to be in the number four, whatever it was, 15 years ago. Now, you know. I see. And, and now they look at you as, you know, as a, more like a legacy, more like a whatever it is. But. I think we're sharper today than we were at the time. It's fair. And and you're you're being a good sport because I'm kind of like picking on you a little <laughs> bit, picking on the world's 50 best. But I think, honestly, you do it once and they won't let you back on the list for whatever reason. <laughs> Sometimes you do a couple couple of years and then uh, we disappear. Yeah. But, but you, you know, to go back to your, your question about the city, I really want to pick a city that's a, a go there on, like going to Shanghai, bringing, you know, bringing 20 new dishes. I come back with 40 new ideas. So that's part of, uh, I think, the... What we do is really, I go with my team and we, we go out every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, we experience different food and come back with like different spices, different combinations, different things. And I think that's what keeps our company going. Um, let's segue, John George, to just in general, when you're on these research trips and you're in Shanghai and you're doing these breakfast, lunch, and dinners, I mean, how do you collect the data? Because there's lots of different ways chefs take inspiration. Are you taking notes? Are you taking iPhone photos? Are you doing video? Are you having a meeting at the end? I'm just fascinated in how you absorb so many, and I know your itinerary is very packed when you're doing Oh, no, it's totally packed, but we wake up early in the morning, go to the market, eat street food, breakfast, you know, those jumping, those, uh, those Chinese crap. Oh my God, so good. Yeah, we, t- we take pictures, we talk about it, we take notes. You know, but mostly, mostly pictures. And then, then at the end of the day, we collect everything and we try when we come back. We, I mean, we smuggle things back. We, yeah. All kind of things. Once, you, I don't know if you remember, there was a Szechuan peppercorn was forbidden to, because there was some kind of bugs. And Isn't that crazy? That was not that long ago. No, probably 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you couldn't get real We fill up two suitcases of Szechuan pepper from, uh, you know, yeah. from Shanghai and bring it over here. It's incredible. <laughs> I could live without it. We had like 10 recipes with session peppercorn in different restaurants. So I needed to bring it. You needed to have like the extra carry on. Yeah. And, but then my next uh-huh. question, it, it relates to how you develop res- recipes. Because, you know, some restaurants uh, will do, all, you know, recipes. They'll do a chalkboard menu. Ch- every day it changes. Like, but for you, you have to lab test, in a sense, recipes, right? To make it sure it's exactly to the level that needs to be on the tasting menu at the flagship. How does that ideation work for you? So we have a couple of... Three people working, uh, you know, we have a culinary director, her name is Tara. Uh, on, we have a Greg Brennan, who is one of our uh, yeah. sorry, culinary director with me for like 30 years. Uh, Daniel Del Vecchio, Daniel Del Vecchio is with me for 20, yeah. 28 years. Um, we collect all this uh, recipe on like, let's say, today we're working on, uh, on sweetbread. And we're going to do like five different recipe, one with uh, licorice, one with, uh, you know, grilled Brez. You will go in and, and observe the test kitchen and, and taste these five. Yeah, I'm dinners. going uh, after the after today. Um, half an hour, I'm going there. We're trying uh, 10 dishes today. And uh, and then once you give it the okay, does it end up on the menu pretty quickly? I mean, first we have to develop the recipe with grammage. You know, you have to be very precise. I mean, every vinaigrette we have, every sauce, yep. every uh, recipe, spice mix, you have to buy the gram. And then we retest it again. And then, uh, then it goes. It's amazing how that works because you can then flip them into the menu every with with an assortment of new recipes. Pretty frequently, you change your menu at the flagship, right? Every every week, every two weeks, every month. You know, I mean, especially from now in the spring, things are changing every week. You know, we have ramps on the market next week. Yeah, we have the morels, uh, white asparagus, then green asparagus. Then you know, it doesn't stop until uh, next uh, November. I gotta say, you probably have white asparagus on your menu all the time. Do you fly it in? No, we really respect the, the season. That's the most important for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they came from, why not they coming from Provence and from uh, Germany, Holland, but they, they're only here for a month and a half, two months, then we move on. I want to ask you about ABCV, my favorite John George restaurant, the one, the flagship that you just reopened. There was a dish on there that I, I'm just getting granular, and this is me nerding out. There was a scrambled eggs with broccoli, Rupert cheese, and dill. Truly the greatest combination for breakfast. Where did this recipe come from? This recipe came from... Uh, 
and we had some eggs in uh, actually in Shanghai. You go back to Shanghai, and we had some. Uh, they do an egg dish there with uh, steamed eggs with uh, greens, some kind of um, not a bok choy, but a gai lang kind of Chinese broccoli with eggs on with body bag. Had some dill. We had some uh, some cheese. Make in New York. Absolutely, so fascinating that you. Link them back to Shanghai. You had a different style broccoli. You're you're you're, you're having it with American style broccoli, cheese from Consider Bardwell. Angela Miller's made book agent, so I have to shout her out. Fantastic, no? Yes, great absolutely. cheese. No, but if you think about it, uh, eggs are kind of rich and creamy. And then you have the the sharp uh, broccoli, you know, the that green flavor with the dill. We had a little chili in there. It's uh, magic. It's really a phenomenal dish. Is this, is it back on the menu at the new ABCV? Yes, it is. I'd love to hear yeah, that. Yeah. And we're actually reopening in breakfast at uh, ABCV in a couple of weeks. I will be there early on. So that dish has always been a that style. I mean, when you were building these three restaurants together, how do you think about that? Because it really is a progressive idea to have these three very unique restaurants. I mean, they came, they came in 14 years, if you think about it. Yeah. Uh, ABCV started in uh, 2010. We took, over, uh, we took over the restaurant, I think it was called Colina. On uh, when they approached me at ABC, I said, oh, "Let's." Uh, they wanted to change the concept. I said, "You know, everybody knows ABC Home Carpet and Home." I said, "Why don't we call it ABC?" They want to call it Love. I said, "They wanted to call it Love." Love, I love said, the restaurant. Yeah, I said, "No, let's go back to ABC of Cooking. We're half a block away from Union Square Market. Everything's gonna be based on the market, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So they love, they love the idea on uh, the farm to table idea on the you know Alice Water meets uh, River Cafe in London meets. Uh, it's New York. On so we that was fourteen years ago. Then uh, Dan Kluger, Chef Dan Kluger, amazing, incredible chef. Yes, absolutely. And then uh, you know we always had a lot of vegetables on the menu. On but then Pipa next door. You remember the Spanish restaurant? Yeah, Pipa. Yeah, Pipa. Pipa. No, it was P I P P A. Yeah, Pipa. Pipa was a Spanish restaurant on Paulette Cole at the time from ABC. She said, "Oh, you have to change this restaurant. They're using." Spam on uh, some bad oil and some whatever it is. And I said, okay, let's change it to another ABC. We do a, we call it ABC Cucina. Yeah. It was, she wanted a more like a tapas uh, restaurant. I say, let's do Spain as a base, but Spain who travels to South America. Yeah. So that's what we did our tacos, our was and you know, inspired from, uh, from the South. And all well reviewed, relatively. You know, as, you know, certain restaurants have their days, but well reviewed. Amazing reviewed. On uh, at the time, we had a chef, uh, Kogan. Chef Kogan was a kind of a Latino chef. Yeah. On that's where we started the pig guacamole. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Two part. Uh, there was a big. Uh, you remember that? <laughs> there was a big controversy. Well, I think Melissa Clark wrote about it. Everybody, and- yeah. Even the president Obama at the time uh, ch- chime in when he said, "Give peace a chance." <laughs> okay, so let's 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 pause for a sec, hey, listener. Let's lean back. You you get, might have a computer in front, a phone in front of you. You can Google P guacamole, and you're going to see this story. Yes, the internet did explode, John George, and yes, our sitting president of the United States weighed in on it. Yeah. Totally. Do you still think it's a good idea? Do you stand behind P guacamole? Totally. I mean, it works so well together. I mean, it was two third avocado, one third peas mashed together. The seasoning is just perfect. To we the, still have it on the menu. We just put it all back on for the spring. You, it's still on the menu. Oh, we just put, oh, yeah. Every spring when the peas start, we put them on the menu. I, I love to hear this, and it just it, it's the for the mere mortal guacamole made with peas. I don't think is good for the mere. <laughs> but but you're fig, you figured it out because you do grammage, right? Grammage. It comes yeah, back you to measure it on a green on green works together. You know? No, totally. So you really uh, you, you can taste peas in your mind. You, avocado uh, creamy on uh, it just. You brought this up, remember? I'm not picking on no, you. No, no, it's okay. Uh, you brought it up. No, I, I you can I, chime in with the internet. It's okay. I think I think it, <laughs> it will the P war. It will probably get its own documentary at some point. <laughs> no, but then the, the last one was ABCV. Oh, we was, didn't actually. Yeah, yeah. So sorry. Let's 14 years ABC Kitchen, 10 years Cucina, on seven years uh, ABCV with Neil Harden, who's uh, really uh, the best, uh, you know, vegetable chef you can meet. It's he's so inspiring. By everything, you know, everything comes out a, a root, a vegetable, and herbs. He he blends it so well, and we do so much testing. We work so well together. Neil's a fantastic chef, and 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 really that that Rupert eggs was was definitely like a go go to for me. But you have doses on the menu, incredible shakes, an aesthetic that I'd say is comforting and 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 also clean. I mean, how do you think about your design for ABCV? 
I mean, all the three design were like, I mean, uh, it's a 100-year-old building. So ABC Kitchen was uh, the old wood beams were uh, 110 years. So we make it look like a barn. ABC V was more, uh, we want to keep something really fresh, clean. You know, it was not, uh, the design is, we saved actually a village in Thailand. We bought uh, that little village in the north of Thailand was doing porcelain. I mean, uh, the little plates on the shutdown and we actually... Paulette was buying uh, those plates for ABC Home and then couldn't, she couldn't buy it anymore because uh, the business was not there on the shutdown. I think it was 2008, a couple of years, four, four years before we opened. And then we, we set up the factory again and uh, we actually we saved uh, probably 200 jobs over there and uh, the factory went back and all the plates at ABC V are from this village in Thailand. It's exact. That's that's phenomenal. Well, it's good to, uh, you know, to help. Uh, and that's what the ethos of ABC is. It's all about, you know, Sourcing from the source. Sourcing Absolutely. from the source. And if you look at the silverware of ABC, we don't have any, nobody eats with the same fork and knife. Oh, really? I didn't even know that. Yeah, we buy everything on eBay's. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, it's uh, all silverware. Or, uh, oh, ABC Kitchen. All three. Oh, 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 right. All right, three right. are each to really not buy anything new. It's you know. not bad for the margin when you're doing e- eBay. <laughs> I mean, you have to fight with somebody else who's on eBay. Yeah, it's know? true, actually. So you have to, to uh, it's like all about bidding, you know. Yeah. Somebody selling five knives, four forks, three spoons. Yeah. Three coffee spoons you have to buy. It. But it's cool. I mean, it makes it makes the experience unique. And, and, and I'm sure for the people working there, it's like cool to have different objects. It's not like cookie cutter. So exactly, exactly. So the tin building, when you're approached with this address, what's going through your mind when they're like, John George, do you want to like open here? Because it... The seaport certainly had its challenges when you started that project. For sure, for sure. But, you know, it started, uh, I was not involved. Uh, I was involved as a consultant in the beginning. I see. So about 12 years ago, they approached me. They say, Harrods Food Court from London is going to come. We hired them. Howard Hughes hired them to create this food court in the old fish market. It was all about saving the market. The, yeah. the, the, the Fulton Fish Market, the tin building was sitting on a 400 wooden pile. And half of them were not even touching the bottom of the river. So the on the building on top was a landmark. So they had to dismantle the building, cut the platform. We saved about 96 uh, uh, cast iron uh, columns. We sent divers underwater to cut uh, the columns who are still attached to the floor, mud line. How, long, how deep is it there in the East River? I'm not sure. I think it's like a, yeah. probably 50 feet yeah. on a, right there. And they had to, because they have to lift the building and push it back 50 feet for, to be above flood line. So, so push the building back 50 feet, planted 200 new concrete pile, pylon, new platform, old building on top. So that, that took about five years. And a few dollars. And a few dollars, yeah. of course. But, uh, but they, they save a the market. They save a total building was completely collapsing, burning on the whole thing. So yep. burned down and et cetera, et cetera. So Harrods was the... The clients who were supposed to bring that food court. I was a consultant just to bring small vendor, Union Square markets, small fishermen, butcher. Six months before Brexit, they say we're not coming anymore. They broke the contract. They call me in a board meeting and say, it's yours now. <laughs> Take care of it. I say, I don't want this. This is too big. It's 55,000 square feet. Yeah. On, I say, give me a day. I'll think about it. On what did you do that day? What did you do? Did I went you... back. I called my team. We got together. Say, they want me to do the, the thing now. But. You know, uh, we've never done anything like it. But you know what? Let's bring New York to under under the under the roof. Not just uh, because not not too many people show up here. You know, yeah. how many times you cook at home? Not not every day. You go, people go out for sure. And like downtown New York, you know, absolutely a renaissance of the downtown scene. And and people need a place to go for a quick meal. For you have several uh, seated restaurants there. So it was fifty five thousand uh, wow. square foot of a, of, a, of a store, a food store with a couple bars and stools like they have in London, I say, we have to do the opposite. So I told the board, I say, listen, I should be 20% market, 80% restaurants. Why, why, why? Because I say, after seven o'clock, nobody buys food anymore. 7.30, everybody, nobody buys food. If you want this business to go until 11 o'clock at night, you have to do a kind of a restaurant center. You got to have alcohol. You, have you got to have bars. a party. You need to have, a, you need to have a, you know, restaurants. So then we decided, uh, we changed the architect. We hired uh, Roman and William, who are 
Yeah. Fantastic. Mostly known for smaller spaces, I would imagine. 55,000 feet is in a Roman Williams project, typically. But, you know, they did La Mercerie, which is a half store, half restaurant. Not 55,000 square. No, no, no. <laughs> On Le Cuckoo, etc. I so. mean, these are beautiful spaces, but certainly these are restaurants, not 55,000 square feet. No, so we, we work with them. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a pandemic. We had nothing else to do than uh, working on uh, yeah. online. On, um, so we created that crazy space with six counters, six sit-down restaurants, so 12 different uh, outlets, middle of a market. But keeping the essence of uh, what team building was, you know. So we kept the kind of the offices above. Yeah. We use all the, the, the columns, everything, and it turned out to be a yeah, so pretty amazing project. I, I love it. I've been a few times. I've had some great food there. But let me ask you, is it doing financially? Did, did it pan out to be what you expected? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the winter time is a little harder. For sure. To go down there. It's a... It's kind of windy on everything, but when you have a beautiful day like yesterday, it's 7,000 people will go to the building. Wow. So it's, uh, you know, the first year was a little harder because we couldn't find any staff to work two years ago. Last year was great. And this year, I think we, we're we going to meet budget. You'll be back into your budget. You'll meet budget. Because <laughs> John George doesn't do a restaurant that's off budget, I got to believe. No. Absolutely. You don't keep failing restaurants open. Absolutely. Absolutely. Only we try. You know, it's a, it's a, you're learning as well. We were learning as a lot there, but the, the restaurant of them and all the House of the Red Pearl, the brasserie. It's a the, cool place, the House of the Pearl. That's I mean, a great... it's amazing. It's, that's a place is doing uh, phenomenal. So Food there is great. Now, let me ask you, is there a favorite that you have there? Like one that you love the most? Uh, probably the one I love the most is probably the... But the, we put the ABCV as well in there. So ABCV is phenomenal. Oh, yeah, you're opening a second location. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah over right. there. And then uh, I like the Frenchman's though. We talked about it a little bit. Let me ask you this. Is there a restaurant that you most regret closing? Probably 66. 66 on Spice, of course. My best. So Spice was more like a, it was more like a sale. So yeah, it a, well, it was our food that he. Um, you didn't know if it was going to close. You didn't say it was going to close because you sold it. You sold it. Yeah, but so. 66 is the one. On 66, we changed the match again, but it, um, you know, it was hard to to change. And, and we don't have any good reviews. You know, we had one bad review, I think, and Vanity Fair from. Uh, I think we refused somebody who wanted to smoke and we said, no, we can smoke in a restaurant. Was it Adrian Gill, maybe? No, no, no. <laughs> if look you look, it. you can say it. I'll yeah. look it up. You're not going to say <laughs> the person's name. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it was a, it was mostly a location, but we put so much effort in there on bringing that master from Hong Kong. I thought it was a very special place. You, it's it's still, I, I mean, you brought it up and I asked you again, it, it's, it's in your mind still, 66. Of, uh, absolutely. Everything, uh, you know, you create is with a... Uh, with your um, dreams on hearts and labor on, on the end, uh, nobody likes to close anything, you know? I really I, I appreciate you being honest about that. I, I love to see 66 back. I, I, I never got a chance to dine there. So, John George, on This Is Taste, we ask guests about their discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. Are you ready? Yes. I mean, I'm... <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't read them, so... I know you didn't. This is good, though. Yeah. <laughs> the best fruit? Mango. Hands down. Is there a variety that you look for? The one you find here from South America, the champagne mango, uh, fantastic. But in Thailand, you have so many uh, varieties of mangoes and they're just all spectacular. I like the, the floral flavor, the texture, the color. It's just the best fruit. The worst vegetable? I think I like pretty much every vegetables. The one I had a hard time to deal with was probably burdock. You know, kind of woody. On, I yeah, know. I mean, if you're not putting it in like a, a, a marinade or any kind yeah, of... Yeah, you, you have to... To make it so, it has to be, I like it probably raw better, but, you know, in a salad, marinated with some sesame oil and some vinegar, but it's a hard to... It's challenging. Challenging. The best dessert? For me, probably a uh, cheesecake. My mother says cheesecake, which is more like a cheese tart. A tart, yeah. It's like a fromage blanc tart for Mazas. When you moved to the United States, what did you think of the, 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 uh, the American style cheesecake? I thought it was good. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice. We had something similar uh, in uh, Alsace as well, but I just like my mom's uh, tart, fromage blanc. Beautiful. Your favorite American fast food chain? Probably Wendy's. I like the spicy chicken sandwich at Wendy's. That you ever is, had it? I, I, I haven't stepped foot into Wendy's. I've been to the drive through for the Frosty. I love this call. No, it's, it's delicious. I mean, the crispy. And you've not taken a dollar from Wendy's. <laughs> all right. All I mean, right. I, you know, I like my Shake Shack as well. Once of course. In a while, but but Wendy's. that was the most really surprising. I respect that, John George. It's a good call. <laughs> I, I haven't had a Wendy's ch- chicken sandwich in a while. Spicy chicken sandwich. Oh, spicy. Let's be very precise. I like that. Your favorite New York City restaurant right now that you do not own? Probably Torisi. I mean, like three times already, and I really think uh, Rich is doing a fabulous job there. Yeah. And the ambiance is great, and the whole, uh, you know, 
details. It reminds me like of, of a spice market. I actually believe I, I was dining there with a friend and I was like, this reminds me of early 2000s downtown New York. Reminds me. I said it. It's funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> I, I get why you like it. Yeah, it's just, you know, wakes you up. Yeah, it does wake you up. Your favorite cookbook of all time. Probably there's nobody knows about it. It's called Alibab, Practical Cooking. You know it? Textbook? No, I don't know this. Oh my God. A-L-I, B-A-B. separate, B-A-B, Alibab. Amazing. I mean, just spectacular. Uh, you know, recipes in there. And you can see tomato water in there from the 1800. Amazing. So it's like a historical text. Yeah. Totally. Interesting. Uh, your favorite recent cookbook discovery? I haven't bought anything uh, recently, but uh, nothing on top of my head. It's all right. What's yours? Uh, I, mean, my, I have a book <laughs> coming out in, uh, in, in April called Career World. So I have to say my book. Your book? Career, yeah, Career World. So it's going to be your book. So my co-author, Dookie Hong, worked at, worked, worked at John George for a year, extern from CAA. He was one of the younger, he was, I think he was like 19 when he worked with you. Amazing. Yeah. Big, formative years for this guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be at the nine things to say about us. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple more. A cuisine you would like to learn more about? Probably Indian. There's so, the country is so big, it's so diverse and so, and so many things to learn on spices and. Yeah. And my, my favorite region is Goa, but um, I want to go Explore more. You haven't s- s- traveled as much as you would. Not like. as much as I wanted. Yeah. 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 I did Udaipur, Kochi, in Goa, but not uh, Mumbai. But uh, there's so much to, to so see. So much there. Kerala yeah. you want to see. I'm sure. I want to see everything. Yeah. Last one. Your favorite sandwich. I have to be a turkey. What's the bread? A rye, rye turkey, lots of mayonnaise with lots of mustard. Condiments. Condiments. King Con- with maybe tur- pickled jalapeno in there. Oh, nice. Oh, I like spicy. Always spicy. Always spicy. You need spices. I mean, that's that's in Thailand. <laughs> your, your time there, I, I respect it. I don't know. I never had turkey sandwich in any place else than, uh, than New America. York City. And yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's 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 a good it's a good New York classic. John George, what a pleasure! Thank you so much Thank for joining us. Thank you so much for having days. me. What's up, Eliza? Let's talk about three things we're each interested in: feeling, loving. All of the above, what is your first thing? My first thing? Well, I have a couple like products to talk about today. I'm actually. in the product zone too. We never, listener, we never tell each other anything. We don't have a shared Google Doc. We don't have an outline. We never share. We, this is spontaneous. I also have products, so let's go. And I'm nervous we have the same things, but maybe not. I don't not. think so. Okay. My first thing is a Sri Lankan milk tea from the brand Cola Goodies. Ooh. Have you tried this brand before? What? A, no, but the name is awesome. What a great name. Yeah, Cola, K-O-L-A. Uh, this is a, it comes in packets. It has loose leaf Ceylon tea and powdered milk. And then when you just mix it with water, it gets so unbelievably creamy and delicious. And then you just kind of let it sit for maybe three minutes and strain it. Um, I've been doing a lot of like moving, unpacking recently, and I've needed extra caffeine. And every afternoon, I will go and make myself a milk tea, and it's so good, and I'm really excited to make cold drinks with it this summer. So are you going to blend with it a little bit this summer, you think? How does I, that work? I think it needs to have the hot water to emulsify, so I think what I might do is just like make a batch of it and then put it in the fridge for later. But I do think if I wanted to make a smoothie that had like banana in it, uh, maybe some kale for hashtag health. That would be a good addition. <laughs> but really right now, it's still cold here. And I've just been enjoying like the a hot. cozy, warm Sri Lankan milk tea in the afternoon. Amazing. And I will just say that I'm kind of dairy sensitive. And something about the powdered milk doesn't really give me that problem. So shout out to that. What's your first thing? My first thing, I'm going to shout out West Elm Australian Wagyu. And not because they hosted this incredible press event, which I, I'm taking the bait. It was a great party. It was at um, it was at Thai Diner. And they had all these great dishes. And they had like roti with with Australian Wagyu. But I'm going to like shout them out for this. I like the way that they're reaching out to the chef community and not the like not the standard chefs. They're like creative with the way they're trying to bring in Australian Wagyu into the lexicon. And Lucasin has a cool video with them. And I just think for a brand that's doing at home and restaurant food service Wagyu, it's a pretty competitive market out there. West Elm, you got my heart because you invited me to a cool party. I'm being super honest, but I'm going to can't wait to cook with you guys. Love it. I love that. I love Thai Diner. So I feel like that's always going to be a win. Totally. And I got to catch up from, with Matt from Thai Diner. And I, um, he's, he's amazing. And he cooked the Taste Launch Party back in 2017 with, with their team at, at, at Uncle Boone's when, it was running, when he was running that. Matt's a really cool dude. 
Um, and Anne, his wife, is great, too. So it's a cool, cool combination there. What's your second one? My second one, and this is one I'm worried you might have, is have you tried the Korean pantry brand Potluck? Uh, I have, and I love it. But I'll let you, this is not one of mine today, but please. Well, talk. I recently tried it for the first time. I was very lucky to receive a bottle of their gochujang. Yep. And it just is really delicious and flavorful. And the kind of shtick is that they're doing these kind of classic pantry ingredients, but maybe with less stabilizers or something similar. Um, And I made a recipe from your cookbook, actually, from Korea World, uh, the like rose takboki with that gochujang. And it was just really delicious. And I'm excited to make more things with it. Oh, thanks for for cooking from the book. I appreciate that. Rose duck bookie is one of my favorites in the book. I love it. I mean, I really think rice cakes are my my staple starch at this point. I just love a chewy, squishy, spicy thing. And it is all of those things. So it was awesome. Thank you. And and I like potluck. And I think disrupting like big gojijan is is really a a tall task. (laughs) Because like CJ and like the major conglomerates in Korea have quite the uh, like corner of the market. But I love seeing small brands doing the thing and, and being original with tenjan or ganjan or gochujang. Yeah, definitely. What's your next thing? My next thing is Passover is around the corner. And I don't know if you caught this, but yesterday, Manischewitz just dropped a rebrand. Whoa. I don't like, know how I feel about this. I know. I was a little bit torn when I saw the heaven, but I clicked on it. I'm like, this is pretty cool I'm art. I'm Googling this right now. So I'm going to read... Um, a quote, it was from an ad week story. The fresh look is a result of interviews with consumers and experts who, through on-site visits to Manischewitz headquarters, Jealous, delved into the historical roots of the company. This exploration highlighted the profound connection between Jewish culture, cuisine, and the importance of family and food while addressing the societal challenges defining Jewish food in a contemporary context. All right. It's cool that they they think about like f- refreshing the brand. My vibe with this is like they love burnt orange. Like they're leaning into burnt orange and you're looking at it for the first time. I see a smile on your face. I'm not sure if this is a smile or you're puzzled. What do you think about the rebrand? I just don't get why it's so orange, I guess. It's pretty orange. Like I think if I didn't know what matzo was and I saw this box, I would be disappointed when I opened it and it wasn't orange. <laughs> However, yeah. I think it's, I think it's hard because when you grow up, you know, I'm also Jewish. I grew up with Manischewitz on my Passover yeah. table. Like you really expect it to look one way. And to me, it's like, why would you why do you need to be hip and cool? I You're know. never going to be hip and cool. You're Manischewitz. You have something else. You have tradition. You know? I know it's 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 a it's a good point. And, you know, they're, they're well known for their matzah latke mix and egg noodles and gefilte fish in a jar. Have you ever had their jarred gefilte fish? Uh, of course I've had their jarred gefilte fish. <laughs> what do you do think? I, I don't really like gefilte dude, fish that much dude, in general. Same. Hard same. And like I, I think it's truly one of the, the most challenging dishes in the Jewish canon. And some people say they like it. I'm fair. I mean, I know that gefilteria used to do a cool one. Yeah. Remember that place? That was cool. But that, I'm not talking about those I guys. mean, okay. My girlfriend Shirley really likes gefilte fish. And I think it's because for her, it's like a fishball like consistency. She actually has like Jewish grandpa flavor preferences sometimes. Oh, or, like, her favorite bagel is like an egg bagel with white fish, which is to me the ultimate grandpa order. But some people do like gefilte fish. I'm sure they will respond to us when they hear this segment. And for Manischewitz, I don't mean to say they shouldn't rebrand because no. clearly I'm already going to buy it. So if they're trying to reach somebody new, maybe this would work. Yeah, but you didn't know. You didn't for me, to... I'm going to stick to my old boxes because they're probably going to taste the same. Yeah, because they're going to be from like 1995 and be taste the same. Yeah. Well, my family, every year growing up, we would do the matzah taste test where we would bring out matzah from the previous year, oh, fun. <laughs> blindfolded with the new box and try to see if anyone <laughs> could tell the difference. That's really fun. I love that. Yeah, and most people can't. So. That's really fun. I, I think that's really great. And I feel like this like idea of like cooking with through the matzah after Passover that feels like it's always challenging. I don't like to do that. I just like to do the meal one time and then pitch the boxes. Save it for next year. It'll Save be it. your new activity. Exactly. And this is like great for waste. I love that. Do you ever do um like matzah brai? Yeah. Yeah. That like thing. chilaquile style. Chilaquile almost. style. Bring it. What's your last one? My last one. Speaking of kind of older person flavor preferences is that I had raisinets recently at the movie theater Ooh. with popcorn and I just feel like more people should be eating raisinets so I just want to say that I <laughs> I love my raisinets experience and I'm excited to have another one. I, I love raisinets it's it's up there snow caps hell no no chance I definitely think Reese's Pieces is my choice I like sometimes when they do the mini Twixes in like a little box those are cool well but I always lean to chocolate I think raisinets are great well, I think raisinets are great because I have never seen them sold outside of a movie theater. 
I know. Kind of like the situational time and place to have them. So I feel like why not lean in? Why not lean in? We just had a great piece that Kathy wrote about dried fruit in this moment that we're having. And I think uh, maybe like a premium raisinette from one of these brands would be pretty cool. What I do you mean, think about that? Sure. Or Raisinets could just rebrand the boxes and everyone's going to think it's premium. <laughs> there we go. L- looking at the Manischewitz. It's like the rebrand. Raisinets needs to rebrand too. No, I like them just how they are. Okay. What's your last thing, Matt? My last thing is this. We're kicking off the like shameless plugs for my book, Korea World. And it's going to happen. Sorry, listener. But I hope you can pick up the book. We worked on it for over three years. And Dukey and I are proud of it. We're doing a launch party in New York City on April 24th at Soul Salon. We have some really cool guests. We're going to have a, a fun party there. We're also speaking with Eric Kim in New York at the Rizzoli store on April 23rd. And we have an event in Los Angeles on May Third in West Hollywood with some guest chefs, Jihi from Perilla, the folks from Soul Sausage, and more to be named. So I'm really excited about it. those are three of many more events, and I'm I'm just plugging. I'm gonna be plugging away as you should, Matt. This is your baby. Thanks. We're all excited. Congratulations. Uh, thanks, Eliza. I didn't know you cooked from the book, and I I really appreciate that. And and I hope um I hope you enjoy more recipes from the Korea world. Yeah, the gochujang caramel corn. Oh, yeah, that's the next one on your list. Great. Thanks a lot for sharing. Mm-hmm. This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumber. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening. 